Good morning, dear ones, and welcome to Trotwood Church of the Brethren Online. We are a church celebrating diversity, strengthened by God, transformed by the Holy Spirit to serve and unify in the name of Jesus. My name is Jennifer Keeney Scar, and it is my continued joy to serve as your pastor. We are continuing our sermon series this morning, exploring Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in a series called Bind Us Together. Today we are reading 10 verses from the second chapter through the theme of forgiveness. Beloved, we are bound together in this moment. We are bound together in the dance of the Holy Spirit. We are bound together in the mystery that is our God. We are bound together in the presence of Christ. Hallelujah for this gift, which offers us continued connection in these difficult days. Come, it's time to light our candles and join our hearts as we begin to worship Holy God. We've come now to the time in our service where we share with one another our joys and concerns. And so I invite you to pause the video here. You can practice this sharing either with the people in the room with you, in a quiet moment between you and your journal, or you know you can always send an email to trotwoodcobrethren at gmail.com with the subject line, joy or concern, and please indicate if we're allowed to share it. Then I'll send an email along on Tuesday morning with those that are appropriate to share so that we can remain in prayer for one another during the week. The prayer requests that you'd rather keep confidential, I will take before God myself. In practicing this sharing week to week and month to month, we commit to bearing our burdens together. We commit to amplifying each other's celebrations in this practice, we remember that we are bound together. If you choose to let the video roll on by, that's just fine. I encourage you to do what feels most supportive to you in this moment. But if you do choose to pause the video, consider taking that moment to pray or to participate in some silence before you return to the video. You can pray or practice this silence on your own or with those in the room with you. This is a moment for you to center with God and connect about all you've shared and all you've heard. Take all the time you need. This moment is for you. I'll be here waiting when you get back.
Will you pray with me? Reconciling Christ, bless our efforts to bring about reconciliation. Give us the strength to persevere without counting the hurts and to find within ourselves the capacity to keep on loving. Give us the grace to be able to stand in the middle of situations and to be a conduit for the deep listening which can lead to healing and forgiveness. Help us to conduct ourselves with dignity, giving and expecting respect, moving from prayer to action and from action back again into prayer. Grant that we may be so grounded in your love that our security is not threatened if we change our minds or begin to see a better way to act. Reconciling Christ, bless us and bless all who engage in the sacred work of envisioning new wholeness and bringing people and nations together. Amen. Hi church family, it's Kayla and Alex back with you again for our final video lesson on the Ten Commandments. This week we are focusing on Commandments 8 through 10, which show us how to love others. So remember to have your ice cream scoops ready so we can add these last three. And let's remember that the Ten Commandments are those ten simple guidelines that God has given us to show that we how much we love God and others and how important He is to us. So the first commandment we are going to go over today is Commandment 8. And Commandment 8 tells us, do not steal from others. So I just drew two little people and one little person found something and is telling the other that this is yours. So just a reminder, if you find something that's not yours, or if you're in a store, just make sure that you follow this rule and do not steal from others. So I'm gonna add that to my ice cream scoop. The next commandment we are focusing on today is commandment nine, and this one says, always tell the truth. So we have drawn a little sign that says honesty, just to remember to always be honest and to tell the truth. The last commandment is the 10th commandment, and it is do not be jealous or envious of others. So I just drew a little sign that said jealousy and put a line through it. And this just means if you see something that somebody else has, don't be jealous of what they have. Just be thankful for what you do have. So I'm going to add our last ice cream scoop to our ice cream cone. So now we have all 10 scoops on our ice cream cone to represent the Ten Commandments. And as we grow and go through life, we need to remember how important it is to focus on giving instead of getting. We should work hard for our own blessings and always share these with other people. And we should always tell the truth and love others and God with all of our hearts. So one way we can show people we love them is to pray for them. And someone once said, that prayers for others flow more easily than prayers for ourselves. So let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, God, for giving us these simple rules to follow, to show you and others how much we love them. We will also follow your guidance to be kind, loving, truthful people of God. Amen. Amen. So now you have your 10 scoops of the Ten Commandments just to help you remind you of the 10 simple guidelines that you need to follow to show God and others how much you love them. So we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.
Hear now a reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So I made up my mind not to make you another painful visit. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I am confident about all of you, that my joy would be the joy of all of you. For I wrote you out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. But if anyone had caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but to some extent, not to exaggerate it, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. So now instead you should forgive and console him so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote for this reason, to test you to know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Our scripture study this week picks up in the middle of one of Paul's lengthier thoughts as he tries to smooth over the unhappy results of a previous letter. If you'll recall from last week, the previous letter was a letter of tears written with much anguish after Paul was poorly treated by a member of the church there in Corinth. Paul was so deeply offended by what happened that instead of coming to visit them again on his way to Macedonia, Paul wrote a letter. We discover today that he chose to write that letter instead of visit because he wanted to spare the Corinthians and himself more pain. He wrote them because he wanted to express his deep love for them. He wrote the letter because he thought he thought it was the best way to handle the situation. Paul was wrong. The letter caused more pain. His wrath came through the letter a lot stronger than his love, and high insight ultimately revealed that the letter wasn't the best way to handle the situation. Have you ever been in a situation where you intended with all your might not to cause anyone pain and still someone ended up hurt? If so, it happens. It happens because human, because being human is a messy business and we have a tough time communicating with others clearly, compassionately, and honestly. I mean, especially when we have this low, this low level of anxiety due to the pandemic and other hardships. I mean, when we are insulted or attacked, our bodies jump into flight or fight mode without our permission. You know, the heat flushes in our cheeks or tears can burn our eyes or our hearts pound a hole in our chest and we get defensive. We might even get combative. We can get really hurt really quickly. We can get frustrated a lot more, um, a lot more quickly than we're used to. And words, words can just tumble into the air between us and whether we mean the words or not or whether we've thought through the words or not they can find their targets like well-aimed daggers and then 
trust gets broken, feelings get hurt, there's confusion, you know, relationships bruise, sometimes they break. But all is not lost. It hurts, but because we're in relationships with each other, it's not over. Not all the time. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, oh, he is ready to forgive. He is eager. (laughs) Paul really wants to patch things up and patch things up fast. He wants to restore the church member who caused him pain. Paul believes the punishment has been sufficient and the community should be as obedient in forgiveness as they are in the punishment. Paul urges them to reaffirm their love for this person they have neglected. And in his rush, he ends the section of the letter with a reminder that they stand together in the presence of Christ. Now, there's something to be said about Paul's rush to forgiveness, but I want to pause here to focus on the fact that they stand together in the presence of Christ. That above anything else is tremendous news. They stand together in the presence of Christ. Christ who loves them and loved them first. Christ in whom they will always find the forgiveness they need. Christ will always be there for them. Forgiveness is the practice of restoring broken relationships. It's the thread that can mend a tear. It's the peace that can calm a bitter storm. It's the balm that can soothe a painful gash. It's offered to us by Christ. But you know, as well as I do, that relationships are broken faster than they are healed. If healing them is the right thing to do based on what happened. Paul can call on the community to forgive the one who harmed him as passionately and as loudly as he likes, but the road to to reconciliation is a much longer one. We don't get that part of the story, but I do wonder how long it took that person to be fully reintegrated into the community after what happened. They stand together in the presence of Christ, and yes, that is so good, but they also stand together in the presence of each other. And if it's right, they must do the work to mend the gap between them, even as Christ has already forgiven them. We don't get to see that part of the story. We don't know what happens. But we are not so different from the early church of Corinth. We don't always handle conflict well, either, in the church or otherwise. We get passionate, like Paul, and write heated letters or emails. We get in each other's faces over big things or over little things. Like the Corinthians, we shun those we don't know how to handle. Or we forgive and forget quickly allowing destructive behavior to continue because that's just how it's always been. And yet, we too stand together in the presence of Christ, the Christ who loves us and in whom we will always find the forgiveness we need. Christ who, even as he forgives, challenges us to do better, to be better. For we stand in each other's presence too. And we are called to offer mercy and consolation to each other as God has offered it to us. And we cannot do that if we are breathing threats and curses at one another in public or in secret. And so we are challenged by Christ to practice the rhythm of forgiveness. And There are lots of theories on what this rhythm might be, but I think this rhythm is something like acknowledgement, repentance, and then some mixture of transformation and forgiveness. 
I believe that first the hurt must be acknowledged for what it was and owned by the person who said or did it. In our scripture today, this might look like the one who hurt Paul coming forward and saying, yes, I did say such and such a thing, or I did do such and such a thing, and it hurt Paul. Or it might look like Paul saying, as he did, I wrote that letter hastily and caught up in anguish, and it hurt you. It happened. The pain was dealt, and the one who dealt it acknowledges it. In her work on the profound importance of the apology, Dr. Harriet Lerner declares this as one of the three gifts offered in a heartfelt apology. It is a gift. Uh, The acknowledgement of the pain is a gift to the one who was hurt. It validates their sense of reality and lets them know that the person who hurt them recognizes the hurt that was caused. It's also a gift to the one who messed up. It allows that person the chance to take responsibility for their actions and to gain a little self-awareness, to know that the impact of our words and the impact of our actions matter. So first, we acknowledge what happened. Don't defend it. Now is not the time to explain or justify or clarify. Just acknowledge it. So we acknowledge the pain that took place. And then we repent or apologize. Dr. Lerner suggests to us that the two words, I'm sorry, are two of the most important words in the English language. But I'm sorry only holds healing power if the words are truly heartfelt. The phrase, I'm sorry, but, isn't an apology. It's a defense. I'm sorry, but I didn't mean to hurt you. Not an apology. I'm sorry, but I feel differently than you. Not an apology. I'm sorry if has the same problem. I'm sorry if I hurt you. Nope. I'm sorry if what I said upset you. No. These two statements fail to acknowledge that hurt actually takes place, that the hurt took place. It negates the apology. It doesn't validate the reality of the hurt. A heartfelt apology might sound a little more like this. I'm sorry I wrote that letter in the heat of the moment and sent it without considering how you might hear it. Or, I'm sorry I yelled and it scared you. If offered in a humble and heartfelt way, an apology has the potential to heal. It's the bridge between acknowledging what happened and doing better in the future. Dr. Lerner writes that an apology is not only a gift to the one who was hurt and a gift to the one who did the hurt, it is also a gift to the relationship. Can you remember a time when you received a heartfelt apology? or a time when you've given a heartfelt apology? What did it mean to your relationship? What, how did it make you feel? How did the other person respond? A heartfelt apology is a place from where forgiveness and transformation can grow. From there, all can be forgiven or At least some of what happened can be forgiven. Forgiveness is a tricky thing sometimes with humans and it really, really depends on the situation. We are not all as apt to forgiveness as Christ is. And that's okay. It's okay not to forgive someone for what they did right away. And depending on what happened, it might be okay not to forgive them at all. It's okay to take the time you need on your way to forgiveness. It's 
most of the time it doesn't happen overnight. But regardless, from here, the one who did the hurting, who is working on the apology, must complete the apology by taking steps to do better in the future. This step must be taken whether or not they are immediately forgiven by the person they hurt. Otherwise, the apology is meaningless. Remember, we all stand forgiven in Christ, even if we aren't forgiven by the human we hurt, or even if we aren't ready to forgive the human who hurt us. We are all forgiven in the presence of Christ, and Christ challenges us to do better, to be better. So a full heartfelt apology might sound something like this. I'm sorry I wrote that letter with such unfiltered emotion and haste. I'm sorry for the pain it caused you. In the future, I will take better care of the words I send to you and I will come to you in person so we can talk. Another example might be, I yelled at you and called you names I shouldn't have. I'm so sorry. In the future, when I'm angry, I'm going to count to 10 and leave the room until I calm down enough to let you know why I'm upset. Acknowledge, apologize, transform, forgive. And then you have to follow through on the transformation part. Otherwise that apology is gonna fall on deaf ears. This rhythm Acknowledge, repent, apologize, transform, forgive, has the power to heal bruised and broken relationships. The Holy Spirit is all over this process, and it gets easier the more you practice it, I promise. It's really hard at first, but it gets easier the more you practice it. And if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Harriet Lerner's take on the apology and how she understands forgiveness, I encourage you to check out her conversation with Brene Brown on the podcast, Unlocking Us. Uh, There's a link to the website below this video. She also has a few books out there, which might be worth checking out if you like to read. Regardless of whether you look into this more or not, it is my hope that you'll be able to see this rhythm in the story of your own life and learn to use it where you can when you make a mistake. This works in marriages, in friendships, in families, church families, and in the workplace. And as I've already said, it does take practice. As one who has tried to practice this, as one who stands in the presence of Christ, who is challenged to be better, so now I also extend that challenge to you. Use this rhythm in your life sometime this week. And if you're not ready to try it out on a real person yet in the heat of the moment, because you should really work up to that, um, try practicing it out. Try practicing it out of the heat of the moment. Um, Sit down with your journal and think about a mistake you made. Think about a time you hurt someone, a minor hurt or a big hurt, whatever makes sense to you, and journal out a heartfelt apology that acknowledges the hurt apologizes for what happened and promises transformation even if you're not ready to offer it to the person or the one you hurt or you can try it out on a friend you trust if you don't like writing things down another way you could practice this is um, if you think of a time someone hurt you you could journal out the heartfelt apology you need to hear the apology that acknowledges your pain apologizes, and then promises transformation, even if it never comes from that person. You could also try saying the apology out loud to yourself in the mirror and just see what happens. And if you need help thinking through any of this, or you get stuck, or you can't help but say, I'm sorry, but, or I'm sorry if, I'm a phone call away or an email away, and I'd be happy to work on it with you. I'm still working on it myself because we are all in this together. You are not alone. Practicing this will help make us a better church family. It'll help us toward healthier relationships and it'll help us to be better humans. And always, 
always remember that you stand in the presence of Christ. You are deeply loved at all times, and you are forgiven. You are deeply loved. You are forgiven. Dear ones, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I sit here each week and I'm just so grateful for each and every one of you, for all the prayers you offer our church family, for all of your tithes and offerings as they faithfully continue to come into our building each week. I say it every week, but it's still true. Your prayers and your financial contributions make services like this possible. It makes our online presence possible, so thank you. I hope that our generosity this week can offer a little mercy and consolation for those who need it most. May our offerings remind us that we are bound together in the presence of Christ, fully loved and fully forgiven. Will you pray with me? Lord, we present these tokens of the many blessings you have poured into our lives. Make us people who are unafraid to proclaim your healing mercies, your boundless love, your forgiveness. Help these gifts to bring hope and comfort to all those who need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close our worship together today, you know that the service continues. I invite you to honor our continued connection to one another throughout this week by sharing in our greeting practice. As always, think about all those beautiful faces in our church you love so deep, dearly. Maybe you haven't seen someone in a really long time and choose one or two of those folks to connect with. Spend a moment either today or sometime this week reaching out to them in whatever way suits best. Spend some time talking about the service, the message, maybe practice one of those apologies and see what's up in their day to day. And if you're into this kind of thing, take a selfie of you and your family waving to the rest of us and then send it to the church office because today begins our selfie parade during the postlude. 
We are doing about five or six photos at a time to spread the parade out over a couple of weeks to really bask in this joy. And so we have plenty of room for more photos. There's still time. Go ahead and send it in. We do all these things so that we can remain connected as a church family until we see each other again, and we want you to be a part of it. So please, practice greeting one another and send in one of those selfies. And now as our worship ends and your day continues, bask in God's deep love for you. Delight in the forgiveness you receive and offer others. And find time to practice one of those heartfelt apologies because we stand together in the presence of Christ.